This is the Stock Trade and Reality Podcast, episode 39. I had to basically sign do a you know a spit handshake agreement with her that I could not take any other funds from our account to add to my broker account. So I had to learn to be a, a trader with a small account. This is the Stock Trading Reality Podcast, where you get to see the realistic side of a trader's journey. Get inspired and stay motivated by everyday normal people who are currently on their journey to trading success. And this is your host, who is absolutely terrible at shooting clay pigeons, but loves it, Clay Trader. And it is flat out embarrassing how bad I am. I've shot at probably, I don't know, like 150, 200, and I think I've hit like six or seven. So I'm really bad at it. And I think part of it is like I can only close one eye. Um, with the, I can only uh, hold my right eye closed. I can't just shut my left eye and leave my... Here, watch me. I'll try to shut my left eye. Watch. And I'm doing it on cam. And Ches and IT Nate, the producer... Uh, it's they a just, pretty I, big struggle. It's a surprising struggle It is. Struggle I, can't, see, I cannot not only close my left eye. So just based on how I hold the rifle, um, I can't you know look down the barrel. And it's just a disaster. Uh, but uh, I live out in the country, and my in-laws also live out in the country. So we just go there and shoot. And, of course, you know, Western Michigan, everybody here hunts besides me, I feel like. Uh, so everybody's real good with guns. My one brother-in-law was in the Marine, so he's got a good shot. And uh, so I'm out there, and they're, they're, it's it's a good family, though. They don't give me a hard time. You know, they just support me and humor me and, oh, good try. You know, just try this and try that, and I just waste ammunition. So it's, it's kind of embarrassing. And then it always gets worse when uh, my wife comes out there, and she hits, like, seven in a row, and I'm like, this is sweet. So, um, you know, sometimes I think that's good, though. Humble pie is always a good thing. You never want to let your pride and – ego spin too far out of control. So um, it's clay pigeons is a big, massive thing of humble pie for me um, as far as I'm concerned. But Chez, how about you? Have you ever shot clay pigeons or try to shoot at anything and uh, you got a good aim or where do you stand on this issue? The last time I shot clay pigeons, I was it was definitely 10 years ago and uh, I was on a, a church outing and my, my dad was there and the whole family and stuff like that. And they did uh, father versus son. And I think I shot like 13 out of 30. My dad shot like 10 out of 30. So that was good. But either way, I can say in one single session, I've shot more clay pigeons than clay has. And he's, uh, he's shot at 250. So I'm, I'm proud to say that, you know, while you're chowing down on that humble pie, I'm over here, you know, looking at an imaginary trophy of me, you know, clay shooting pigeons against you. But, you know what's uh, bizarre about this? It just dawned on me. I took that cheap shot at you when we ended this interview, and you're like, I'm going to get true. you back at another time. But here I you told got you, me you back. didn't see it coming. In the, yeah, you didn't in see the it sequence coming. of things, you actually got me first. So now it makes me look like I'm out for <laughs> revenge. So, <laughs> that's wow. True. That's, that's, man. We might have to edit this in the way where it comes across as me getting you first because now it's going to play as well played, sir. You just totally mic dropped me once again. So. Nate's you on got my me, side, so we'll make gonna... sure it comes out the correct order in which it is presented. So you you do yeah. you do some good work, Nate. You keep up the good work and don't listen to this clay guy. I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah, Nate, you better stop doing a crappy job. And I promise everybody that'll make more sense as we get into this interview. So for today's interview, we are interviewing Jeremy. Uh, he goes by Remy in the chat room, and he's not around a whole lot compared to some other people. But uh, you know, he's a West Coast person. He explains more of that on uh, you know, why he's not necessarily around as, uh, as, uh, as much as other people. But it's uh, a, a good little interview here. Uh, it's a good perspective on things. And uh, when we ask him about his routine and kind of how he approaches the market, uh, he gives a very interesting and uh, something that I'd never heard of before. Uh, but you know what he does in regards to Mondays, I think people would say, oh, that's kind of an interesting approach. I'm not saying wrong or anything like that. Uh, but neither Ches and I you know, had heard that. And uh, you know, then the business he's in, uh, it's it's pretty funny, and he's got a he's got a good sense of humor about it. So, uh, without further ado, let's hear about Jeremy's story. All right, Jeremy, aka Remy, with a taco wearing a sombrero as your avatar. What's going on, man? Everything is going great. How are you doing? Fantastic, fantastic. We were just talking a little bit earlier, uh, and Jeremy um, is he, as his self proclaimed, he is a West Coast Clan member. So he's usually in the lounge later on at night when it's uh, Eastern Time Zone, folks are usually in bed. So uh, if you haven't seen him in the chat room, he is in there. Again, Remy is his screen name, and he's got an avatar, uh, as he explained, a taco wearing a sombrero. Uh, is there any meaning behind that, Jeremy? Just quickly off the kind of a random question, but what's up with the avatar? 
You know, just being from Southern California, I think uh, we can relate to Mexican food. Um, and so I felt like, you know, if I put this on here, it'll kind of represent the West Coast SoCal favorite food area. Um, and people can recognize it. SoCal. I'm not quite sure I know what that means. I'm assuming Southern California. But yeah, you got the lingo down on everything. Chez, is this how you talk to? Yeah, bro. It's a real Southern cool kind of wit. Yeah. The Southern, SoCal is just Southern California. NorCal is Northern California. So you did good. You did good uh, being a Midwesterner and doing your investigation right there. Yeah, but I, what's up with that? You guys are, what, too lazy to say Northern or Southern? I mean, uh, you guys are too busy surfboarding or what? The time is money, that's not even a thing. You should it's know surfing. that time is money. So the less we can speak, the more we can get done and the more money we can make. That's what we're that's, going that's for. That's called a mic drop. You just mic <laughs> I, I cannot argue against that. That is true. That is true. So, all right, we've established that Jeremy and Chez have a so- SoCal bond here. Um, and we were talking about this earlier, but uh, KBIO right now at the time of this uh, recording is just in absolute beast mode. Uh, and we were uh, discussing that beforehand. So, Jeremy, I'll just start off with that. Have you traded that at all, or what you just been observing? I, to be completely honest, I looked at KBIO when you mentioned something in the lounge um, the other day about it being $4. And so I took a look at it, um, and I'll probably talk about this a little bit later, but I have a buddy of mine who's a biotech junkie, and I kind of sent him a note saying, like, hey, what's going on? With, with that right now. And he said, you know what? Shorts are being caught with their pants down. They're not enough shares to uh, buy back. And so uh, he's like, you're, you're going to see people run into trouble right now. And I asked if he was going to jump on it. But he's like, I mean, you can't predict a ceiling on this thing. So it is what it is now. <laughs> so you don't know if he got any shares or not? No, he, he didn't. But um, sadly enough, uh, he's in a, a circle of friends, I guess you would say, uh, that were short that that stock and uh, unfortunately didn't get out of it in, in time and lost lost a couple of grand uh, in the six. So the circle category. now looks like more like a polygon or something like that. I'm assuming at this point. I mean, that's I, uh, yeah. I haven't seen him on Twitter in a while, so I I don't yeah, know what happened. Yeah, and just to give a little more context for people that are listening to this, uh, or actually whenever it goes live, uh, but KBIO uh, started at what like 40, 50 cents or something like that a few days ago. Uh, and then, you know, we were talking about it in the chat room at $4 after hours. And now today, as of when we're doing this recording, it's hit like 46 or something. Uh, where's it at right now, Chuz or Jeremy? I don't have my chart up. Uh, yeah. I have no idea. Last I looked, it was at like 38. <laughs> so, and that's off the highs of 45. So I don't know. It yeah. could be back up to 70 for all we know at this point. Yeah. It's that so crazy. It's, uh, yeah, it's been an absolute beast. So, uh, but anyways, let's, uh, let's learn more about you here, Jeremy. So let's go to the start. I mean, what got you interested uh, you know, what kind of was your first impressions on the market? What made you finally decide to hop in? You know, um, I actually have always had an entrepreneur spirit. Uh, I started a company uh, in the music industry a, a long time ago, um, and uh, it was before I got married to my wife. Uh, and then uh, after that, I, the economy dropped, and I think uh, in '09. I was. Uh, I just got married. My wife and I went to go meet with a financial advisor, and he kind of started talking to me about uh, mutual funds. And he gave me an example of you know if you can get your four hundred one k to to about a a million dollars, you know, and and mutual funds will give you an average of eight to ten percent return year by year, year over year, and you can basically live off that eighty k, hundred k a year. And I thought that. Man, you know, it's a long time to wait, number one, to get to that point. And number two, uh, I felt like that I could do a better job than the mutual funds by by looking into stocks. Um, and so that's where it started to pique my interest was back in 2011. And uh, um, it's all because of this one financial advisor. So uh, I opened an account with some spare cash. Um, I took about... I think it was like twenty five hundred dollars. Uh, open account with uh, with a broker, um, and my I decided to look at Nasdaq because Nasdaq has this like twelve step analysis of analyzing a stock, and I like use this written frame on like all right, let me let me analyze a stock. I had no idea what I was doing, no education, just like stupidity, and I ended up my first purchase with. With this, with this money in this account was uh, Marvel M R V L, 
And um, it was a small, small dollar amount. I looked for something that was I, with $2,500, what can you buy? You know, looked for small dollars. I saw it. I kind of did this 12 step analysis by NASDAQ. And uh, do you remember any of the steps in this analysis? I'm curious. What were, I mean, just any of the steps? You don't have to list off all 12, but I mean, what were a few of them? One of them was was understanding PE ratio. Oh, I was good just grief. Say, I, was oh, say, no. I want to jump in and say, I'll bet you any money PE ratio is in there somewhere. And this <laughs> Anybody like, got a vomit bag? <laughs> oh, uh, good grief. Why did I ask that question? You, you guys are going to laugh, but like I have this legitimately still written in my notes uh, from 2011 to 12 stock analysis. And it was like revenue, you know, EPS, ROE, return on equity. The earning surprises and all this stuff. So I literally took the 12 steps and and purchased MRVL. And I ended up making a, like a hefty $20 before I sold out. And I was like, oh, my God, I just killed it. I just made 20 bucks. Uh, this is insane. And my next purchase, um, I took like maybe 50% of my total account value and purchased Apple, three shares of Apple. And then I I just realized that um, number one I can't predict the stock market, <laughs> and uh, number two I, you have to hold share you had to hold shares for a long time with a small account in order to build some sort of equity off of them, um, and that's when I kind of once I bought Apple I just sat on it for about uh, two years almost three years um, until this last Christmas I ran into my. Uh, bio junkie friend um, who is he's actually pretty successful he turned 5k into 300,000 in about three years um, and it wasn't just off of one trade I, I felt like he knew what he's doing or whatnot but um, I realized shortly after I talked to him last Christmas that I was heavily uneducated and number one I didn't have a large account so it'd be hard for me to gain uh, uh, with that type of thing and also number two uh, I didn't know anything about options and it was something that I needed to get into so um, that's where my education process started but during the meantime in that I tried to I tried to actually puppet trade with my biotech friend and uh, it worked out it worked out like a charm at the beginning um, I don't know if you remember but back in February uh, CLDN uh, did a little bit of a run, um, and I ended up banking almost 500 bucks on that because um, he told me, "Hey, this, you know, with my uh, what was it? His uh, cash flow, a uh, discounted cash flow." So, and, so here's the thing, though. So, you having that small account, though, you just were unhappy with the size returns that you were going to get on that. So that's what kind of led you to want to learn kind of maybe more about options. Is that what your your biotech friend was trading? Because those are obviously you know pretty exponential gains to go from five thousand to three hundred thousand. So was that kind of the the vehicle he was using, and you're just going to start you know buying off of his entries or whatever if he texted you or called you or something? Was that how it went? Yeah, pretty much. I mean. I the one thing was my wife was not happy that I was jumping into the stock market because she thought that um like once I once I open an account like our house and our, and everything was in jeopardy um and that you know I could end up losing everything and we'd end up in a divorce and all this crazy stuff and it it was very difficult for me to tell her like about some of the the things that I've learned in my education at, in the stock market. I mean, I gotta, you... I gotta cut you off right. I can yeah. totally relate to that. Um, I still remember when I was first getting started and everything. Like there was something just off with my wife and I. Like just there was just it, there was something off in our relationship in terms of communi- Just there was something weird, and then it finally came out that well, my wife she finally disclosed to me that you know she's worried, she's kind of stressed out. She doesn't want to lose the house, uh, which triggered me. I mean, she don't want this and that. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. No, no, that's not how this works. The, the money I'm using for trading, I could lose it all. And it's like not going to affect our house payment. It's not going to affect all this stuff. So I can totally, and that's funny how you bring that up. My wife was the same way. She was, and it went a while where she was just living thinking that, oh, geez, you know, Clay's just one day away from potentially, you know, us having to sell a house and having to do this and having to do that. And, uh, so I, I know how that conversation goes. Not to cut you off, but that's a totally relatable moment for me. Uh, so I guess we can turn this into a learning moment. 
Uh, we'll turn this into the relationship show real quick, but <laughs> for your significant other, it might be worth explaining to them and letting them know that, hey, you know what? If I lose all my money, we can still make our mortgage payment. We can still make our rent payment. We can still do that. Now, if you cannot tell your significant other that, you are not, you're using money that you should not be using. So we'll turn this into a dual edge learning uh, example here. So again, it might be worth explaining uh, to your wife or boyfriend or girlfriend or husband that everything's okay if you lose all your money. But again, if it's not going to be okay if you lose all the money, then you're playing with money you should not uh, use. I mean, did you have anything like this with Kelly, Chez? Um, I did, but at the same time, Kelly's always been so supportive of me that she was trying to throw money at me to do it because she, you know, she believes in me and she wants me to know that she stands behind me. But at the same time, I'm like, no, you can't do that. You have to let me, you know, get my feet wet first. And, you know, gotta, we got to make sure we have good habits in place because I'm not, you know, I'm not willing to put her 401k because she was she said you know i'll roll my stuff into an ira and you can trade it for me i said no 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 we're not there yet we don't have enough experience but um yeah she wasn't she wasn't you know um kind of similar in that sense that she worried about you know if a trade goes against me we'll have to sell our vehicles or something so no gotcha. i didn't have that with her all right well sorry to cut you off jeremy but that was a that was a good little uh, yeah learning thing there so your wife is singing this so how do, i mean how do you explain that to her and then where'd it go from there well you know the 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 problem was that I did not tell my wife that I was taking this spare $2,500 that I had when I was single and putting it into an account for trading. So I actually did the wrong thing and not communicate at the beginning. Uh, and that's why I think it took her by surprise that we were going to lose our house from the $2,500 that I put in there and all this stuff. And I was already put myself into a bad place. So, um, yeah, my wife probably could have got to the point and to a supportive area, but, um, I obviously didn't communicate that effectively, uh, to make her feel comfortable with that. Um, but you know, eventually I had to basically sign, do a, you know, a spit handshake agreement with her that I could not take any other funds from our account to add to my broker account. So I had to learn to be a trader with a small account done deal. And that's really what I've had to do uh, for the, from the time I actually started to put, when I put money in and through this whole process, I've been working with a small account and I said, Hey, you know, if my friend can do it, I can do it. But yeah, it's been a lot harder than that. <laughs> so, okay. That, that, I really like that. Actually, that, that spit handshake agreement will go with the small account, which is what Chaz pretty much was saying too. just get your feet wet, learn things. But you mentioned uh, before we started to uh, interrupt you and kind of go off on different tangents, but you decided that you're going to puppet trade uh, this biotech junkie friend of yours. So let's get back to there. How did how were you, you know, puppet trading and, you know, how did all that go? So, you know, um, it actually the puppet trading started at the beginning of this year um, and. I did CLDN was one of them that did turned out great in VIV. Uh, started to turn out great because we started to uh, connect. You know, he he shared with me that you know, hey, you can follow, you can follow the gal who is uh, part of this this actual pharmaceutical drug company, and she's basically one of the 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 testing recipients. And she would post things that I'm like, man, is it legal to post these things? Like, she's she got this you know spine thing that is helping her progress and. If she reported anything new, like the stock would jump and it was like, wow, you could actually, once she posts something, why don't you just jump in and, and make some money? So we started doing that uh, and it started to pay off a little bit. So I'm like, wow, you know, just puppet trading is working out well. Um, and then one day. Here's the catch. Here's well, the catch. Then the, the one catch day is, what happened? The catch is coming, but I, like it solidified my uh, my my choice to puppet trade him. When oh, so he, fool's gold's coming. Yes, what you're saying. fool's gold. Exactly, exactly. And I wish I knew about fool's gold. Um, AQ, well, wouldn't it be fool's gold if you knew about fool's gold? So that's, right, right. That's that, there's true. the great quandary right there. That's the truth. Um, so my buddy told me, hey, jump into AQXP. Uh, AQXP was $1.70. And I said, okay, and this was on August 3rd. I remember, I remember AQXP. This is going to be about the biggest amount of fool's gold that fool's gold is. So, I okay, I, this is going to get good. Yeah, so I jumped in AQXP, and he's like, hey, they're supposed to have an investor meeting, and uh, I think this thing's going to jump. And so the investor meeting came and gone. Nothing really happened, so we both 
he sold out and I kind of held it a little bit. And just before the market closed, I sold it. Uh, and then like August 5th or 6th or something, the stock went from $1.70 to $55. And I was like, I literally missed the boat on that. I sold it the day before it jumped to 55, just like this whole KBIO instance. And I then I was like, you know what? Puppet trading's the best. I'm going to do this forever. And then now here comes the Okay, the so part. just so I so I understand, the fool's gold here came from more so hindsight trading where you're sitting looking in the rearview mirror saying, "Oh, I was right. I just happened to hop out too soon." So that's where the fool's is is that kind of where exactly. the fool's gold Okay, so exactly. in your rearview mirror Wow, I was right and right in a huge way, and I do remember that 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 was a crazy move too, for sure. Yeah, I, I thought you know KBIO. After I saw KBIO, I was like, you know what, that just surpassed AQXP uh, just by the sheer timing that it went to where it went to. But uh, after that, um, I my my buddy advised me, hey, you know, when you buy shares and they, you're coming up to a catalyst event in a biotech. You do not want to hold those shares. Whether it's great or it's terrible, the stock is going to either plummet 70% or, you know, just rise 70%. So you're not going to be able to, to do anything and get out just based off the sheer volume. So, so uh, XOMA um, decided to have a catalyst event. I took in basically... 66% of my account at the time, which my account at the time, I, I grew it from from 2,500 to about 6K uh, in this year, up from February to August. And then um, when Zoma hit, uh, or XOMA came out with its catalyst, I was holding 66% of my account and it plummeted. Uh, all the way down to about a dollar fifty when it was it was up at like I think six dollars, and I ended up losing sixty six percent of my total account. Um, back down to almost twenty five hundred dollars from where I started at the beginning of the year, <laughs> and that is when I, I honestly um, I had been educating myself on option trading. I've been going. I, I mean, everything known to man. I went to the CBOE site where they have little training courses on it. I did everything. Maybe it was, uh, I don't know, not the smartest routes I could have taken, but I did everything. But the one thing that I did not include was actually being able to read charts. And that's how I, I found you, Clay. Um, and watching your videos, I, I would watch all the videos that you would put out and because you were actually calling out some stocks that I were watching. Uh, AEZS, does that sound familiar? Uh, I think I've done that one once or twice, maybe yeah. once or twice. Just a stupid penny, truck, uh, penny stock that took about $500 of my, my money as well. Uh, I thought I can jump into penny stocks. Uh, and I, I, you know, I'm one of the lucky ones. It took me about three weeks to figure out that, like, these things – uh, are are pumped and dumped gloriously, and you just never really can know when that was going to happen. So I've kind of stayed away from them, but I dabbled in them uh, for a while. And then I, I've read a lot of your newsletters that came out about penny stocks, and um, I just started following your char your charts with you know support and resistance, and um, being able to identify uh, areas where you know you can be able to just be you know at least cautious, continuous, and, and know exactly, you know, not know exactly, but just have like a good rough estimate where price points are, are really effective in a stock. So I started doing some studying on that. Um, I developed a, a trading plan uh, based off of that. Um, and I ended up, you know, using that trading plan from August to now and was been able to actually increase my account by almost 50% so far to date um, just by that types of study. So it's been a it's been a whirlwind of things, but I've been able to put together, I feel like, a, a good trading plan just based off of just some of the 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 uh, the education you provide you provide us traders. Uh, I felt like yours paid off more than than some of the things that I've been doing in the past. Nice. Now in all this sequence, when did you uh, become a member of the chat room? I actually became a member, I think it was 
just at the end of August after I <laughs> after I lost 66% of my account um, and and I was trying to make a comeback and I just realized you know everybody talks about trading plans like have your own trading plan it work some people work for others it some it doesn't and I had to find a trading plan that worked for my small account um, that I have a spit handshake on and I can't add additional funds to. So I have to really I have to be really careful when analyzing, really disciplined when analyzing and educated with this small account um, just so that I can at least uh, be able to slow and steady make some money every week. Right, yeah, no, exactly. So um, I mean how kind of what 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 are you using within your trading plan now? Are you using options? Are you going? I mean, you're not doing penny stocks anymore, right? No, I. You know what? I learned quickly after I lost five hundred bucks on A E A E Z S um, that uh, it's it's a game that I have no idea about. Um, and if you have written articles and you know tweets and everything about penny stocks that I've been reading about I kind of started to stay away from that all my trading plan is basically based off of options so I do a lot of option tradings um, and uh, weekly I, I trade the weeklies so I'm I'm in on options for a one week span every week um, and I just use a lot of probability um, and I use a lot of support and resistance to determine, and trends, obviously, to determine what option trades I'm going to make. So are, so are you doing the advanced option strategies, or are you just tra or playing strictly you know, directional? I'm doing advanced option strategies. I usually stick to, um, I usually stick to spreads. Um, right now, uh, just based off of you know, SPX, um, I've been actually looking at... Um, you know what kind of trend I can see out of that uh, in the weeklies, and be able to kind of place. I usually been placing a lot of put spreads, and the reason why I like them is you can buy back the short and let the put run because everybody knows that it, it you drop big, but you you take the stairs up, you know. And so I'd end up uh, if if I felt like the once it broke the you know the support level um i'd end up buying back my short and letting the put run and it's been pretty it's helped me but um just <laughs> just last week i had a put spread on uh cmg and CM, cmg uh -oh. started yeah it started to come back on and it my i every time i put on an option trade a spread I put out alerts about three dollars out from my short um, and I end up once that's alerted I have a choice am I gonna buy back the short or am I just gonna close the spread altogether and so it got to that point because you know Ch Chipotle wasn't tanking at the at the moment and my I I didn't trust the charts I didn't trust it I got scared and I, I closed out my entire spread and I went back and said, "Hey, what happens if I bought back my short?" And I looked at, I looked at where I, I actually had my my I was long C, CMG along a put CMG, and uh, I missed out on a six thousand two hundred dollar opportunity last week. Hey man, you uh, you sound like you fit in real well here at Hindsight Club, and we, <laughs> we, we are happy to take your admission in the form of lost profits because that's what we do here. But uh, explain real quick to the listeners because a lot of people might be think that Jeremy's full of crap. How can something move six thousand percent? But there were some. Did you follow the headlines on Chipotle, Chez? I did not. I think I just saw that it was completely tanking. I, I was it a sourcing issue, a food sourcing issue? Yeah, or something? the e E. coli breakout thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there was a shortage in the states for that. So, so yeah, that's that totally really, possible, uh, really right, Chaz? I mean, because oh, yeah. some listeners may think that uh, no, six thousand percent, but in options, that's possible, right? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. So options are going to move in a much more exponential nature than just an equity alone. And there's like like we talk about all the time. There's so many different ways you can kind of structure your advanced option trades to either mimic a stock or kind of you know. Take those or make those six thousand percent moves. So you can kind of do all that stuff. And Jeremy, it's cool to hear that you actually uh, trade the SPX because I thought I was the only one who did that. So it's cool to see another uh, advanced options trader kind of using that. But, um, but yeah, it sounds like you know you got your plan, and um, you know obviously you're going to miss out on some profits. You can't always be right. But um, you know what? Why did you decide to start using 
um, like spread trading or options trading in general, did you kind of see the the value in you know taking possibly a smaller account and and you know being able to play names that are much larger than you know these these penny stock micro caps? Is that why you decided to go to the options route? It, yeah, absolutely. I, I went the options route was because I had it. I had a small account. Um, and options allow you to do that, um, and you can hedge your positions. Uh, you can dictate what your risk level is that you want to take on these. Um, you can, you know, put a spread uh, as far out as the stand one standard deviation as you want to, just depending on the type of credit you want to take in. Um, I I I, w- I know exactly what I want to make weekly. Um, but I, you know, obviously I have to find a trend within a stock first so I can kind of assume a directional, um, you know, it can go against me a little bit and it can go, but if I see that a trend is, is setting up based off of, uh, I have a, several EMAs that I watch. I, I have like kind of a, an eight, a 15, a 21, uh, 15. I think I have a 50, no, 21, 100, and 200, and watch those levels. Um, and if I start seeing a trend, I'll kind of usually put in my option at the 21-day 21, 21 EMA um, and and kind of see if I can keep that, that trend alive and, and be able to take in a hefty credit for that. Um, but option trading just provides a lot of flexibility for small accounts. Um, but the best thing is, is, you know, like, I've learned from Clay is like if you know your support and resistance levels and price point and where you see a lot of reaction happening, um, you can really go right in right behind those support levels or right above those resistant levels and be able to have at least a wall or a barrier uh, that I like to visualize then it kind of running and, and me taking a loss. I can I can sit there with confidence and have, you know, 80, 80 to 75 percent of my my spreads expire worthless uh, on Fridays, and it's been it's been awesome. I mean, it's been a, a great experience to do that with a small trading account. I wish I could have the accounts that some of these guys uh, have, you know, out in the marketplace because you got you know you have some room to play with, and you can take a little bit more risk. But yeah, I got to go slow and steady because uh, I got to keep that firm handshake with my wife, <laughs> so she so she doesn't shut it down, uh, you know, um, and. Uh, and hopefully I can get up to the point where, um, you know, I double the size of it and, and be able to, to take a little bit more risk on it. Yeah, I mean, the advanced options, it's definitely uh, not a get-quick-rich thing or, uh, you know, get-rich-quick, I think. But uh, it's slow. It's, uh, it's like my mother-in-law says, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So uh, that's kind of what the uh, advanced op- – that's what trading in general is, though. I mean, there is no get-rich-quick overnight, and anybody that's trying to – portray that to you is just trying to get you to probably my guess buy some sort of strategy or learn how to trade like them so don't don't fall for that garbage it's uh there's no way around it it's just a one step at a time uh i'm curious about because you mentioned risk and that's one of the things you can measure risk with these advanced options so in terms of losing um how did you used to take losses i mean did it like really mentally screw you up did it uh, you know, just what were the what were the emotions compared to how do you now deal with losses? How do you take losses? Are are you seeing any progress in that regards to your trading? Yeah, man, I used to take losses pretty bad. Um, I, yeah, you know, I I could I could literally I would throw I would want to throw my chair around uh, over the room, but I I, I wouldn't. Um, but yeah, I have really would be so frustrated on losses, and it's kind of now turned a little bit i still am emotional about the uh the potential profits that i missed out on because i didn't make the right decision so luckily it's not uh, i'm frustrated because the losses that i've taken because uh, uh, it's now i'm frustrated at the potential move i could have made to have made that profit and uh, i'm still kind of learning that game at taking the emotion out of it uh, cuz i feel like and I, you know i could be completely wrong i feel like with a small account like you know $1 loss is huge uh or you know $100 loss is, is big and so like i try to keep those as minimal as possible um but yeah i i've kind of had to i've kind of had to learn to to put my emotions in check, I like the I like the uh, slogan that you have. It speaks volumes, uh, and I'm I'm learning that game as we speak. Uh, and people in the chat room have been pretty cool to just even um, to even listen. 
when you, you have a frustration and, and put their two cents that, you know, I think I see Chez maybe every day, at least right. Hey, there's always another trade. Uh, I always at least see that every time that I'm in the chat room and cause someone's, you know, kind of stressing over a, a trade they made that, that went the wrong way on them. And, you know, he's like, Oh, you know what? There's always another trade or, Hey, if you miss that, there's always another trade. And I've, I've been taking that in, uh, week by week for sure. Yeah, it's definitely something that gets better with time in the sense of you kind of realize and and by no means is, do I want any listeners to think that I'm some veteran here. I've literally been in this market for, you know, two and a half, almost three years only. But the more seat time you get, you know, it you're going to have red days, you're going to have red trades. And as kind of time goes on, you realize that, you know, if you manage your risk correctly, you know, those days don't matter. Like, it's, you know, don't get me wrong. And I, I'm in completely in full agreement with you in the sense that when you have a small account, you know, losing 25 bucks hurts. It hurts a lot. Losing 50 bucks hurts. Losing 100 bucks is like the worst day in the world. And and to people who are listening, you know, they might think like, oh, I mean, I make $100 a day at my job. You know, it's no big deal. But this account, you have a lot riding on it. And percentage-wise, it's a big amount to you. But um, yeah, slow and steady definitely does win the race. And, you know, I think you're doing that completely right in the sense of, you know, just, just keep going at it. You know, take those high probability trades and, you know, uh, make sure that nothing spins out of control. Because you know that very easily it takes only one bad trade if you're not uh, struggling right to completely wipe out your account like you lost 66 percent of your account that one time but um are there any you know what would you say is a typical routine for you for for your trading i know you're trading kind of weeklies um sounds like you're generating kind of weekly income based on probabilities and support and resistance and trends uh, you know what do you set these trades up on monday and then you know just check in on them throughout the day do you have a do you have a day job that you work at as well so you only check it on your phone or something you know what, what's a typical trading day for you look like um it's funny you say that. I, I actually don't trade on Mondays. Uh, the reason why I don't trade on Mondays is because I just want to see what the market's reaction is to a new week. Um, and I look to see what the SPX is doing. If, if, there's gonna, if there's a trend developing, because the market has been so volatile, um, all the high liquid stocks like CMG, Amazon, you know, Google, uh, Netflix, all these stocks have so much volatility to them that you can actually go out a decent ways from the strike price or from at the money and strike price and be able to take in like a good 50 cents or, a, you know, a dollar and be comfortable with like the 70 percent probability that this is going to expire worthless um, approach to it. So I'll wait Mondays. Mondays um, are my office days at work. I actually work from home and I sell toilets for a living for, with a reputable plumbing manufacturer. Um, not yeah, just- Chaz, we've been interviewing all kinds of people. We can officially say <laughs> we've interviewed somebody that sells toilets, man. This is awesome. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, Clay. I talked to Jeremy before we did the podcast. And when you're asking me about his background, I said, I'm not going to tell you anything because I want you to hear it from him first. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I yeah. actually did do that, but that's pretty crazy. Yep. Uh, we, we have interviewed people from all walks of life. That's for sure. Hey, well, yeah. I got a question for you real quick. Is it yeah. true that the guy that invented the toilet's name is John Crapper? Well, that is the truth. He invented the flapper. Yeah, John Crapper. He invented John Crapper invented the John flapper. John Crapper the flapper. invented the flapper. That's just perfect. Yeah, I you know I need to go to the John. I need to hit the John, or you know I need to obviously take a crap. But um, yeah, that's where we get that fun terminology. I I work. Yeah, the company I work for. Um, I, you know, I obviously sell more than toilets, but it's just so fun to say that my career involves me selling toilets uh, because people don't understand like you know how you do you sell toilets i mean uh there's a whole other uh world out there when it comes to plumbing so um yeah you know, month- toilets it's, it's a great business i mean if you try to sell mcdonald's okay well some people are going to be into their health some people i don't like meat some people i just don't like mcdonald's but there's this bodily function right Ches, that we all have that it doesn't say, matter whether is, or not we like it yeah it's, it's, it's going to happen yeah, it's one of those things where you, it can't be replaced. There's nothing unless we somehow, I'm not even going to go down this route of what would have to happen. But yeah, it's kind of something that's always going to happen. You know, yeah, your children are going to have to do it. Their children are going to have to do it. And, you know, people are going to need to replace them at points too. So yeah, I think uh, I think that's a good business to be yeah, in. I might have to look into a demand. job in that. 
There's yeah. always going to be demand in the toilet business. So I mean, unless Chez figures out a way how to virtually go number two, I will invest in your ticker symbol. You Thanks. need to hey, tell me hey, that is. I was going to say, I'm going to talk to some uh, bio companies. And maybe they can make a pill or something where you never have to go number two ever again. So I don't know here. I'll Actually. let you know the ticker if I ever talk to them. No, I'm not going to lie. I never, I never thought this podcast would go down the rabbit hole of talking about number twos, but it fits. <laughs> It fits, yeah. so you just got to go with it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that, that's the thing is, uh, um, yeah, so like Mondays are my office days. I, I see what's going on out in the world on in the toilet section in Southern California, and then I look at the market to see if the XPX is going down the toilet. And uh, Well played, sir. Right, you like that one? <laughs> yeah, right. that was good. Well played. Let's throw that out there. Um, and yeah, and then uh, once I start seeing some trends develop or um, I see if, uh, you you know, uh, the market's coming up to some resistance or some support level. Um, I start making my decisions on all right, which liquid stocks. I do stick to a lot of liquid stocks. Um, uh, a watch list of that. I'll see which ones are trending pretty heavily. I'll go out probably around uh, the. I'll go out in the 70th percentile if I feel kind of bullish or a bearish to neutral. Um, and, and, and my spreads, or if I see just a, a really great trend happening, like Netflix last week, it was at, I think it was at 114, um, and I put in actual a really solid spread right at the money at like 113, or at 113.50, and it actually launched up to about 23 um, after it broke through um, resistant level. I was pretty confident in that, at least I felt confident in that. It could have gone against me, but. Um, just kind of look at that on Tuesday. I'll trade Tuesdays. Uh, I'll look for trends on Wednesdays and sometimes on Thursdays I'll look at it. And then Fridays I don't look at it at all. I just kind of hope that everything expires worthless. Look at what my delta is. Uh, if the delta is sitting around two, three, whatever. I mean, if it's not close to 25, uh, I feel pretty confident uh, that it's going to expire worthless. And um, I try hard, maybe that's why you don't see me on the chat rooms as, as frequently during the day, but I try hard not to look at the markets because I want to put in my, my, um, my trades and kind of go do my thing. But I set alerts like 3 to $4 out from where my short is on all my spreads. And I'll go do my thing. I'll go sell toilets all day. And then I'll you come sell back. That crap, man. You sell I do. that crap. Yeah. yeah. Go out there all day and, and hustle it. And then um, I'll come back. To, I'll look at it about it's lunchtime on the Pacific Coast around 1 p.m. when the market closes here. And um, I'll look at where I'm at, look at my deltas on all my spreads. And then, uh, you know, try not to get too greedy and try to put too many spreads out there and, and kill my, my margin on that. Um, so that's kind of like the the day-to-day -day for this tele, uh, toilet salesman. That's, uh, that's really cool. I've, I've, I don't think I've ever heard that, not even just on the podcast, but you just totally avoid Monday. I mean, it makes sense. You just kind of want to see how the week's unfolding. So that's, uh, uh, you know, that's an interesting little tool. Have you ever heard that, Chez? I mean, just not necessarily here, but in any um, of your... I've, I've had people that say they wait the first hour on Mondays, but that's, that's about the extent of it. They've never fully avoided that day. Now, at the, But on to counter that, though, we actually, I know a lot of people in the inner circle just specifically that try to completely avoid Fridays because statistically, and I was the same way, I would always, I generally have more red days than I would have green days, and I know that's probably more mental, but hey, numbers don't lie, so uh, on Fridays, I just never traded well, and I know I'm not alone in that sense, but yeah, I haven't heard of anybody specifically avoiding Monday the entire day, but um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, that's cool, and I mean, it sounds like it's working for you, so that's awesome. Well, we're going to be wrapping things up here real quick, but I want to end uh, with at least a couple more questions. One of them, uh, you know, what are some things that you, you think you're doing very well right now so that, you know, what are some strengths and then what are some things that you want to improve on, you know, so, you know, what are some weaknesses that you uh, are recognizing and want to just keep on, you know, chipping away at? Um, I'll start with the weaknesses because <laughs> I guess that's easy in trading. Uh, weaknesses. It, that's, it definitely is. Uh, weaknesses, I, I, I realize that I still need more education. Um, uh, I, I, think that the more that you're educated, the more disciplined you can become. And I think that the market takes a lot of discipline. Um, and you, you kind of have to trust yourself because uh, if you're educated, it's easier, easier to trust yourself. Um, so on the weakness side, I feel like there's a lot more education that I can have uh, to, to firm this up because, you know, I could – do a lot more advanced options that can pay off, but you know the the 
I guess the fear or whatever can take over and, and that's something that you just, you know, well, I don't personally want to have, uh, on the strength side, um, I, I take a lot of education courses, um, building plans, uh, with, with my work, my, my actual career. Uh, I have, a uh, a, a pro programs that I have to put together, uh, that work with different types of architects, designers, developers, and builders here. Uh, and I create strategic plans on building growth. So, um, that's a strength of mine of putting together plans that I can have growth on this trading side and, and have a solid game plan. So I feel like it's a good strength side of mine, but I feel like in order to continue to build on that plan and become successful, I got to focus on, on the education side of it and learn a little bit more, uh, actually a lot more so that I could, you know, turn into a, to a guru. Does that exist? A trading guru? I don't know. I, I mean, I've never, I've never heard of those before. I'm sure they're not all over the internet and every message board <laughs> and all social media. Right, right. No but, joke. Um, I mean, it sounds like you, you kind of have a firm grasp on what, uh, what you excel at and what you need to work on, and you have kind of a plan for the future. That's a, I think that's another thing that really distinguishes who's going to make it and who isn't is that you have to kind of look forward and see where do you want to be and how are you going to get there. Uh, without that, you know, obviously you, you have to be in the moment when you're trading. But at the same time, you have to have a plan to move forward. You're always going to kind of just stay in place. But um, uh, Clay has tried to take the patent rights from uh, from a device I created. It is my time machine, and I refuse to give up that patent, Clay. So stop asking. I got to find some better lawyers. Yeah, you definitely. <laughs> IT Nate is not doing so good on that. Yeah, uh, how to be a lawyer for dummies book. But uh, besides <laughs> that, um, Jeremy, if you had to kind of go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice when you started trading, what do you think that piece of advice would be? Uh, open an account when your wife knows about it <laughs> so that I could have probably had more funds to start with and and be able to have a a, a little bit uh, larger account and um, I think that having my wife know about that the, the spit handshake uh, keeping a, a small account you know obviously I think it it all works out hand in hand uh, I could have lost 66 percent of 15 grand. Um, which definitely would have not been good. So maybe it, it was in the cards for me to have this small account and learn those lessons. But um, yeah, I probably would would go back in time and, and share that information because you never know. We so communication within a communication. relationship is what you're getting at here. Is you wish you would have communicated better. <laughs> However, I will say that I think it's uh, a mixed blessing or a blessing in disguise, I should say, that you are only starting with 2500 because you hit the nail on the head. What happens if you did have fifteen thousand dollars in that account? Who knows what kind of boneheaded thing you would have done, you know, back at the start, and uh, it it could have been a lot worse. So, um, yeah. but yeah, that's that's a good way to look at it. But yeah, com everybody listening, communicate. Just communicate with your significant other. That's uh, that that goes a long way. So now we're gonna move into some fun questions, and we're gonna learn about more of you as a person. Right. Um, so just don't give us any crappy answers, okay? <laughs> I won't. <laughs> yeah. Chez loved that. Yeah, Chez. Uh, that was a good one. All right. So uh, I just got to let the boss do what the boss is going <laughs> to do. <laughs> just, just let me talk crap, okay? Just yeah. back off and just just let me live in my glory, okay? All right. So what is your favorite movie? You know what? Uh, and, and this is not because we're coming up to the holiday season, but my favorite movie of all time is White Christmas with Bing Crosby. It is a classic. Classic. Have you, not, have you not seen that, Clay? I have not. I don't think I've seen that. I, just, I, I don't believe you. I bet you you've seen it. You just haven't seen it in a while. Maybe, it's but like I'm going to write it down. I'm adding it to the music list. because you the music the list, the movie list. I can assure you, growing up in the Midwest, it's something we've all watched. So I mean, I've seen I, It's a Wonderful it, Life, but that's not the same thing, right? No, it's not the same thing. Right. Either way, I'm I'm sure you've seen it, but um, good choice, and that's that's uh, interesting considering you're saying that not because it's the holidays. It is a really good movie, but um, I guess it's a feel good movie that it is. It, it is warms definitely the heart. a feel good movie. But uh, what would you say is your favorite meal and dessert? Favorite meal, so you know, just like my avatar, I am a big fan of carne asada tacos, man. That is the with guacamole. Got to throw the guacamole on there, but that is my my favorite meal and dessert. You know, the sad thing is, I I swear I was born without a sweet tooth. Um, I don't know what it is. Uh, like I don't eat a ton of desserts, and that's not because I'm trying to prevent any weight gain. I literally 
just trying to, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I, I do love my wife's cookies. She makes these like coconut cookies that are unbelievable. And they're, they're like rather light tasting, not too rich. So it actually, it fits the bill for me. Nice. Nice. So in terms of traveling, where's some place that you'd like to visit someday? You know, um, it's funny you, you said that. Um, like in the music industry, I, I've been able to travel like almost 45 states, every major city. Uh, um, but I've always wanted to actually go fishing in Alaska. I've, I've never been there before, but I've, I've had uh, uh, some coworkers and friends who've gone up there fishing. And I think uh, I'm, I might want to go up there during the summer when it's light all day and, and give it a shot. So Alaska would be one of them. Very cool. Yeah, I haven't been there either. I had some family who lived there, but um, they moved back since then. But uh, what would you say you do for fun and hobbies kind of outside of selling toilets and trading the, the market weekly? <laughs> I, uh, the hobbies for me, uh, I do enjoy. Uh, I am an avid um, sports player, so I do play softball on a very competitive team. So I do like playing softball. What position? Uh, I am actually the pitcher, believe oh, it. Oh, man. Do you, do you wear like a mask at all or is your just face out there just ready to get hit? My face is ready to get hit. I, I feel like uh, my reaction time can keep up with it, but um, I've taken some shots that, uh, that the, I think it comes off the bat at like 104 miles an hour or something. You're only 60 feet away. So, um, Clay, it's only a matter of time. I was going to say, so that's a problem. To- that's a problem. It's kind of like an options expiring. When your <laughs> reflexes expire, you're not losing money. You're like losing teeth, which Clay, I guess yeah, needs. Yeah. Clay, Clay, you're going to like this one. He's got a crap load of confidence. <laughs> <Yeah. about that. laughs> well played. Oh, man. This whole po- oh, this thing is – there's a toilet salesman. There, the jokes are a plenty. There's okay. just a crap load of jokes we could use. I mean, it really is just um, – there may, anyway. be av- there may be an avatar change here in the <laughs> yeah, just, a, just, a just put a toilet right there. I that'd, just be, put a toilet. that'd be fantastic. I what about so you mentioned you're in the music industry. So what kind of music or you know, do you like to listen to or do you have any favorite bands or anything? I I I am a little bit of a music snob, um, not by choice, but I my favorite band actually right now, well not now, but my favorite band of all time is Fleetwood Mac. Big fan of Fleetwood Mac. But a um, couple bands that I'd recommend uh, that I that are way up on the charts for me are Doves, Elbow, uh, two of the top bands came out of the the UK that I really love, uh, and Coldplay. Listen, I, I've heard that you like Coldplay, um, and Coldplay. give me the brutal, honest truth. As I was going to ask you honestly when you're done, I was going to say, well, what are your thoughts on Coldplay since you're a music snob? So I want to hear your opinion here and be brutally honest. I, to be honest with you, Chris Martin is a fantastic writer. The band is great. Uh, it's a solid band, and they've been around for a long time. Any band that can stick around for a long, long time, they, you know, they, they've got it. So uh, I've always been a Coldplay fan, but I've always been part of, and, and loved the whole, you know, melodic music scene in itself. But, yeah, Coldplay is, is, a, is a band up there on my charts. It is. I thought I, I thought he was just gonna bring the hammer down on me for a second. <laughs> no, but, no. Man, I, I was expecting the hammer. Who do you wait? Who do you like, there. Chess? Because I want to get his opinion on yours real quick. Oh no, this is in my podcast. So, well, what are your thoughts on Britney Spears? Because that's who Chess uh, is. I, I know, I know, you're all about uh, the Frozen soundtrack, Clay. But I, I understand it's because you have a daughter who watches it probably a hundred yeah, times. A week, I can't so. deny that. So, um, but <laughs> Chess has uh, a final question for you. That's always uh, interesting. Go for it. Go for it, so, Britney. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm going to let you have that one, but I'm going to get you in another podcast. <laughs> yeah. You just mark my words here. But um, so, Jeremy, what what are three words you believe should be associated with a successful trader? Well, I think it's a great question. Um, n- number one would be educated, because uh, that has helped me tremendously. Um, uh, disciplined would be another one, uh, and I also think passionate. Uh, I think uh, passion brings all sorts of creative thinking uh, and, and smart decision-making sometimes. So I, I think those would be uh, my three things. No, that's – passion is always a good one because, you know, I, I feel sorry for the people where you can tell they just really don't like this stuff, but they want to make a bunch of money. And because they want to make a bunch of money, oh, I hear you can make money in the stock market, but they have no passion for it. It's like, oh, 
there's so much work that you have to do. If you don't like this stuff, if you don't have a passion for it, then you have zero percent chance at success. If you just think you're going to follow other people around or do this and take the lazy path through because you don't have any true passion. So, yeah, that's that's a great word. And I think that's probably one I would use with that question just because, yeah, there's absolutely no hope in this business if you don't actually like trying to learn this stuff and trying to learn the market as a whole. So good answers there. Well, Jeremy, Mr. Toilet Salesman, uh, thank you. I mean, this is amazing. I, Chesson, thank you for not telling me that background because uh, <laughs> I did ask Ches before I got started. So what's the, the background story here? And Nah, I'm not going to tell you anything. I'll just let you find out. So that was a good call on your part. <laughs> no problem. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> yeah. So, but thank you very much for taking time out of your day. Hopefully, you didn't miss out on a crap load of toilet cells. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. And if you, you know, if you run into any clogs out there, you you got a buddy who. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we may have to uh, we may have to talk you know I, I don't think I'm in the toilet I don't think my wife and I are looking for any new toilets but who knows maybe I'll pick maybe I'll pick your brain I'm really searching for a toilet joke right now but I'm I'm stumbling so I guess I don't have that quick of quit so all right well for those of you listening uh, and if you had a good time and found some value here I'd like for you to ask or do a few things if you're listening to this at claytrader.com go ahead and click that share button leave us a comment down below uh, we like to hear from people and we're always uh you know we read them and uh, we'll reply so uh, if you could do that, that's appreciated. If you're listening to this on iTunes, please uh, subscribe um, and leave us a rating. Uh, again, all feedback is always appreciated, and we do read those. So thank you for hanging out with us this afternoon or whenever you're listening to this, and we will see you back for the next episode. This has been the Stock Trading Reality Podcast. Thanks for taking the time to hang out. To learn more about Clay and the Clay Trader community, including the trading team, premium training, and more, visit claytrader.com.